Hi, I'm Kevin. Welcome to my cave. Now that we have explored transistors a lot more fully, we're ready to get, take a big leap in designing our voltage-controlled oscillator. We should be able to advance in this episode to having a fully functional triangle wave generator that is stable and symmetrical over nearly the whole audio range. So let's get started. Let's review where we were with our oscillator. We had a capacitor whose voltage was the current state of the triangle wave. We had a current source to charge the capacitor and a current sink to discharge it. The source and sink were connected to the capacitor through an electronic switch made up of four diodes, controlling whether the capacitor was charging or discharging at any given moment. The voltage on the capacitor went into a Schmidt trigger that would change state when the sawtooth reached its upper and lower bounds. The output from the Schmidt trigger controlled the switch. At one logic level, the capacitor would charge. When it reached a maximum level determined by the Schmidt trigger, the trigger would flip the switch and the capacitor would discharge. The Schmidt trigger also provided a convenient logic level output, switching at the same frequency as the triangle wave. We're going to keep the same idea of charging and discharging a capacitor through a switch, but now we have more tools to do the job. The design I'm going to present is based on the triangle wave oscillator inside the Buchla 259 complex waveform generator. Aaron Lanterman has a nice presentation of this oscillator in his course on analog audio synthesis, but he stopped short of showing how the component values were determined. Also, I want to design to more modern components and to the plus or minus 12 volt supplies of Eurorack rather than the plus or minus 15 volts that Buchla used. So let's start hacking up this circuit. We'll still have a variable current sink, but I'll be making new circuitry there to get rid of temperature dependence and make the tuning more repeatable. Up top, though, I'll get rid of the current source. Having the charge and discharge slopes be independent made it insanely difficult to get accurate pitch and symmetry at the same time, so that current source has got to go. We'll replace it with a current mirror. That replacement means we need a different style of switch, We'll take a detailed look at that switch shortly. Rather than have the current simply flow into a capacitor, we'll put in a proper integrator. That will give us a constant voltage for the current sources to flow into, killing variations from the early effect. It also lets the two ends of the integration capacitor be at different DC bias levels. With the bias levels different, we can choose the triangle wave bias in such a way that we can replace the Schmidt trigger. A simple comparison of an adjusted triangle wave voltage against the logic level will tell us whether it has crossed the threshold. When the switch is to the left, current is drawn out of the programming port of the mirror. An equal current flows out of the mirror's output port and into the integrator. The integrator charges, so its output voltage falls. When the voltage on the integrator, suitably adjusted, reaches ground, the comparator changes state and the switch turns to the right. Now the current is flowing out of the capacitor and into the current sink, discharging the capacitor at the same constant rate. There's zero current flowing into the programming port of the mirror, so there's zero current out of its output port. It's effectively out of the circuit in this phase. The integrator's output voltage rises until the adjusted value reaches the logic high level. The switch flips back, and the cycle starts over again. With this basic circuit concept in hand, let's take a look at how our new switch will work. We'll soon see that we already have circuits in hand to carry out all the other functions. Our switch begins with two transistors, with their emitters tied together and tied to our variable current source. This configuration is called a differential pair, and we'll soon see a lot of it in our companion series on transistor theory. But this particular one is easy to understand. We don't need ever small or even beta. We can go all the way back to our second lesson on transistors. A transistor will adjust the collector emitter resistance to keep its emitter a diode drop below its base. Of course, it can do that only by changing its resistance. If the transistor has a tiny resistance and the emitter still can't be pulled up, the transistor is saturated and the current between emitter and collector will be very high. 
On the other hand, if the base is less than a diode drop above the emitter, with no current flowing through the collector, the transistor is cut off. And here we will have one of each. We will feed the right-hand transistor with a logic voltage, either a logic high voltage that we'll call V sub H, or else a voltage that is very close to ground. The only thing I know so far about V sub H is that it must be much more than two diode drops above ground. A couple or three volts is enough. We'll hook up a voltage divider on the other transistor space to hold it at the midpoint between logic high and ground. Let's first ground the right-hand base. The transistor will pull its emitter up to a diode drop below ground. At that voltage level, the left-hand transistor's base emitter junction is heavily forward biased, and it will pass lots of current, limited only by the current that the current sink can accept. The right-hand transistor will be cut off and pass negligible current. So a ground on the right-hand transistor means that the top left lead will sink all the current. Now instead, let's tie the right-hand base to the logic high voltage. The right-hand transistor will pull its emitter up to a diode drop below that. That's above the base voltage on the left-hand transistor, so this time the left-hand transistor is cut off and the right-hand one will pass lots of current, again limited only by the current sink. So a logic high on the right-hand transistor means that the top right lead will sink all the current. All the rest of the blocks are variations on themes we've seen before. So let's fire up KiCad and draw the thing. I'll show it in time-lapse, since it took me about 45 minutes. Keep your eyes open, because I'm about to make a bunch of mistakes! Of course there's a corrected version on the project GitHub. There's a link down in the doobly-doo. Oh, I should mention that I drew this first in my notebook, but I don't want to inflict my handwriting on my viewers. The first thing I'm doing here is adding a few files to the project library for the parts I'm using here. I'm not a real expert in managing symbols and footprints in KiCad, but I managed to muddle through somehow. I'll start by drawing the left-hand column of stuff. There are a lot of devices that stack vertically, and that will guide the rest of the schematic layout. I'll place the parts for the current mirror, this is the exact Sam Wilson mirror that we demonstrated over in the Transistors 101 series. There should be a link somewhere nearby. Next in the stack is the transistor pair that make up the switch that we just saw. I calculated the resistor values before I started on the keycat drawing, but for this video I'll come back later to explain where they came from. The ones you see here are wrong anyway. Now for the current source. I'll use a circuit similar to our quick and dirty current source. There should be a link nearby. But instead of using the forward voltage drop of an LED, I'm going to use a highly stable TL431B voltage reference. The TL431 needs a little over a milliamp for its own internal housekeeping. I'll give it about two. The 2.5 volt reference voltage will set a current with the emitter resistors. A 1 megohm pot is the most convenient value I have on hand. At full scale, that will give me a 2.5 microamp current. I'll choose a padding resistor to give me a current 256 times bigger with the pot all the way to the left. That will give me an 8 octave range, about the same as a piano keyboard. 2.5 to 640 microamps is a decent range for the current mirror in the integrator. I'll bypass the TL431B with a 10 microfarad electrolytic. Now I'll place the op amp for the integrator and the comparator. No, wait a minute. KiCad's symbols for those place the plus input at the top. I wrote both of those in my notebook with minus at the top. Having it the wrong way around bugs me. Let me make my own versions of the parts with the symbols right side up. Oh, 
Okay, now I won't get the hives every time I use a TL-071 or an LM-311. Now I can start building the integrator. Except for component values, the integrator also looks just like one we built in an earlier episode. We'll be designing for the triangle wave to be 5 volts peak to peak, centered on ground. A 6.8 nanofarad capacitor will give us ideally a frequency range of about 37 Hz to about 9400 Hz for the currents we expect. It doesn't matter what the voltage is on the left side of the capacitor. We can choose whatever bias point we need on the right hand side. The switch needs it to be higher than the logic voltage, which I know will not exceed 5 volts, so I'll choose 6 volts. A divider will generate that voltage and put it on the plus input of the op amp. When I saw Buchla's original circuit, I was a little puzzled by the slightly strange divider that I saw after the integrator. I thought sure that another op amp would be needed somewhere to scale the logic signal. But Buchla found a way to save one op amp, plus a resistor or two, by fudging the logic level just a little bit. We'll start by realizing that the output will have to be a ground potential if the input is at the negative 2.5 volt peak. That observation by itself is enough to determine the divider ratio. It has to be 4.8 to 1 if we're using a 5 volt peak to peak triangle at a 12 volt power supply. But now let's look at what happens at the top of the triangle wave. The divider will give an output a little above 4 volts. That's perfectly fine as a logic high level feeding a 5 volt CMOS gate, for instance. So this somewhat eccentric scheme will work and it determines that unload logic high level that I've already mentioned a couple of times. Because I use 1% resistors in the 5% standard values, I can actually get better precision by searching for a pair of values as close as possible to the right ratio. I have a little Python script that does that for me, which you can find on the project GitHub. It turns out that 7.5k and 36k are exactly a 1 to 4.8 ratio. So I'll draw in that divider here and hook up the comparator to its output. The comparator's plus input is the same as its output, low pass filtered at a frequency well above the audio spectrum to suppress glitches. The logic output is also the logic input of our switch. The comparator's output has to be pulled up to the 4.14 logic high level using a voltage divider. Oops, I forgot to fill in the capacitor value in the low pass filter. Now I can continue with the divider. I gave the needed ratio to the Python script and it disgorged resistor values of 43k and 82k. I can get away with these high values because the only loads will be the comparator input, the base current of the switch, and possibly a CMOS gate or two downstream. If I had more stuff to connect, I'd cut these resistor values by a factor of 10 and possibly add an op-amp buffer. Now to go back, check everything, and add annotations so I can keep track of the purpose of everything. I had better add connectors for the triangle and logic level outputs, and draw in the power supply and bypassing. Oh, I forgot to fill in the divider values for the left-hand transistor of the switch. It needs to be at half the 4.14 logic high voltage, or 2.07 volts. The Python script gives me 75k and 360k as suitable values. Again, these can be high values because the currents involved are tiny. And I finally remembered to fill in the 36k on the divider after the integrator. I'll annotate a couple of points with the voltages I expect to see. Some more description, and we should be good to go. Except that I want to give myself a sanity check, so off camera, I drew the same circuit in circuit JS. The model is on the project GitHub, of course. And it looks good. A triangle wave of plus or minus two and a half volts, and a square wave at the 4.14 volt logic level. Let's breadboard it.
Future Kevin here. This is already quite a long video. Breadboarding and testing the circuit has turned out to be an adventure, so I think I'm going to have to break off here and continue the saga in a part two next week. I hope you'll stay tuned for that. Subscribe and ring the notification bell so you don't miss it. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, stay curious, and take care of one another. Bye.